This conference will now be recorded. Hello and welcome everybody. It's John Antonucci. This is ANCAN's High Risk Metastatic Advanced Prostate Cancer Discussion and Support Group for 26 March 2024. We're going to get started in a minute, but first I want to acknowledge some of the sponsors that make this possible without uh, demanding any advertising or prompting of their products or anything like that. And that's Bayer and Novartis, Johnson & Johnson and Myriad Genetics, Telix and Blue Earth Diagnostics. We um, start our meetings uh, usually by uh, welcoming and talking to the new guy and uh, if if he wants to and that's Chaz tonight I lost your picture Chaz are you still oh I see you I am I came back so you're familiar already with how we operate and um, I will just ask you a few basic questions about your history so that we can get to know you okay okay and then uh, what I'd like to know is um, you know why you came what you're looking for what questions you have so I got your name. Uh, what's your age? I'm 74. Same as me. And where do you live, Chaz? Chicago. Okay. And uh, let's go back in time a little bit to when you first got uh, diagnosed. Tell us when that was and why you got tested and all that. I was diagnosed at the end of 2012. Um, oh, it's a while. I, yeah. Good. I've been, I've been walking this road for a while now, like a lot of you gentlemen. Um, I had a biopsy uh, in early December. Of 2012? 2012 of 2012. Okay. Uh, Gleason 3 plus 4. A number of cores, I don't remember exactly how many were implicated. Um, about a month later, in the middle of January 2013, I had a, a robotic radical prostatectomy at Northwestern here in Chicago. Uh, okay. my, surgeon, my surgeon was a guy named Daniel Dalton. Dalton? D-A-L-T-O-N. What was your um, PSA, by the way, when you first got diagnosed? You know, my PSA has never been very high, but never I, ended up, I ended up having the biopsy because it jumped from two something to five something within about a six month period. And my, okay. uh, my internist caught it towards the end of 2012 and recommended that I go see a, a urologist, which led me to Dalton. Okay. Um, so then um, you and Dr. Dalton decided that uh, you wanted to just try to get rid of it. Exactly. And then what happened? Um, the pathology came back four plus three with about 50% of the gland implicated. There was some extension. Um, what's the word? Extra, Extra capillary. Yeah. Uh, but the margins were clear, no lymph node involvement, no seminal vesicle involvement. Um, okay. And I was I was pretty good for a couple of months. My PSA went down to undetectable. But later in 2013, it began to rise again, my PSA. Um, and in 2014, I had my first round of uh, follow-up radiation. Okay. That was at Loyola Hospital. My uh, radiology oncologist is a guy named Matthew Harkenrider, who's taken care of me for the last 10 years. I, I love this guy. Uh, so he probably, pr probably back at that time, he did the usual 40 or 45 sessions of EBRT. Yes. And it was all and, in the prostate bed. 
and any seeds put in or anything? Oh no, you lost your uh, you lost your prostate right. in the RP. Okay. And I did not right. have I did not have hormone therapy with that first round of radiation. Oh oh. Okay. Uh, but my PSA went to undetectable again, um, and stayed there uh, for about eighteen months, and then began to tick up again. Uh, I was getting the PSA test every three months, and finally, um, in uh, mid twenty nineteen. Um, the, my, my radiation oncologist recommended a scan. Um, I'm sorry, I don't remember exactly what the PSA was, but throughout all this, it's never really gotten much above two. Um, yeah, some, some people hardly make any PSA and that reduces its value as a, as a indication of where you are. Um, the scan at that point in 2019 showed um, some, uh, some infected lymph nodes in the pelvic area, but outside the prostate bed. So I went back in for another round of radiation in that area. And this time I did have a Lupron, six month Lupron shot first and uh, was taking bicalutamide during the course of radiation. Gotcha. That was another 36 or 38 session um, IBRT. Wow. Okay. Uh, and that did the job after uh, I was tested for the first time about three months after we finished that round of radiation. And again, my PSA was undetectable until 2022 when it started to rise again. Um, and this time it's down around one, but um, it was increasing at an increasing rate every three months. So I went in for another scan and there were two um, lymph nodes in my abdomen on the right side. Um, so I went back in again for another round of radiation and again had Lupron and took the bicalutamide during that uh, course of radiation. That was in 2022 and um, I finished that up right at the end of 2022. Um, Did you get your usual good response again? Yes, except PSA didn't go to undetectable. It only went down to like 0.1, um, but stayed, you know, stayed low until uh, late in 2023 when it started to to jump up again. And at one point between October and December 2023, it went up by about 50% just in three months. It's still very low, it's still only like 0.68, but it, but it was increasing pretty rapidly. So I had another PET scan at the beginning of this year in January 2024, which showed uh, two lymph nodes in my left shoulder and two spots on my spine. Um, at that point, um, my radiation oncologist uh, said it was time to hand me off to a medical oncologist. And he recommended a doctor at Loyola who I uh, saw in uh, the middle of February. But um, before I saw her, I'd been talking to my radiology guy. Um, he knew that I, I mean, I'd complained to him a little bit about the side effects of the Lupron. So he recommended that I switch to Orgovix this time. And um, after some back and forth with 
Orgovix, I was approved for that. So I've been taking Orgovix since the beginning of February this year. Okay, all by itself? All by itself because I'm kind of in limbo with my new uh, medical oncologist and getting a second uh, anti-androgen drug. Um, she gave me the choice of enzalutamide or abiraterone and I didn't want to fool around with prednisone, so I chose the enzalutamide and then tried to get approved um, because it's so expensive. I, I asked them for financial assistance, and I just found out last week that I, I was denied for that. So now I'm in the process of uh, trying to shift over and get a prescription for abiraterone from my current medical oncologist. But... Um, in the meantime, I started taking the Orgovix on February 1st, and I saw the medical oncologist on the 19th of February, and she tested my PSA that day. And just based on the just on the Orgovix alone, um, my PSA went down about 30 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway. What's your um, medical oncologist's name? Her name is Amy A.M.I. Badami, B-A-D-A-M-I. And she's at Loyola Hospital in uh, Maywood, Illinois. Is she a, a prostate cancer specialist? She is not. Okay. Which brings me to my next point. After listening to all of you guys for the last couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pick that up quicker, I know. <laughs> yeah. And talking to my my uh, buddy here in Chicago who runs our S2 group, Jim Schrade. Um, He's our buddy, I, too. Yeah. Uh, and Jim's the reason I'm here. He told me about you guys and insisted that I get hooked into these meetings. Um, but I told I told Harkenrider, my radiology guy, that I wanted a second opinion. He gave me a couple of names. Jim suggested some people, and then I heard all of your conversations. And one name that was in common in all those groups was uh, Shmulowitz, the University of Chicago. Yeah. So I have an appointment with him in a couple of weeks. And uh, I mean, I expect that I will want to become a patient of his because uh, I think I, I really do want to move to somebody who focuses on, the pro on prostate cancer. Okay. Yeah, yeah he does. Uh, I yeah. hope you like him because we have confidence in him. We'd yeah. we'd feel comfortable with you if you wind up with him. Did any of your docs ever do any genetic testing? I've never had genetic testing. Okay. Um, I also only once in the whole course of this has anybody ever um, uh, checked my testosterone level. Oh, oh. And that was my internist when I went in a year ago for my regular annual checkup. Um, and that was right at the end of the last six month Lupron shot that I had. Yeah. And it was it was like thirty three or something. It was it was very low. Okay. So we call that a castrate level, but we don't even know what your baseline is because nobody ever did it before. Nobody right? ever did a baseline, right. Do you feel like you don't have any testosterone? Did, did, did I you sure get... do. I sure oh, do. Okay. <laughs> I feel crappy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, that was the issue with the Lupron. I had a lot of fatigue. I was pretty active. Um, but, you know, that, that first round of radiation with the Lupron came right at the beginning of the pandemic. So everything shut down. I sat yeah. down, you know, I work from home. I sit at the computer all day and uh, that's, has not been good for me, but I do feel lack of energy. I have some anxiety. I never really bothered that much by hot flashes, but um, so far in the Orgovix, it seems to be better. When I first started taking it, I felt, um, I felt a little bit more fatigued, but I feel like I'm coming out from under that now. And, um, you know, I, 
I believe, based on what I know about what's happening to me, that my disease responds pretty well to the the hormone treatment. So, yeah, it responded well to X-ray therapy. It responds well to hormone therapy, um, and it's slow, but it's persistent, isn't it? Persistent, right? <laughs> but uh, but yeah, you do respond nicely to treatments. Okay, are you a veteran? I'm not. Not a veteran. Okay. Okay, so I think we got a good picture of your story. What 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 are we missing? What's important, and what questions do you have right now? I suppose Dr. Schmuel is going to talk to you about your questions about getting on a second line anti-androgen. Right. And um, I've also been intrigued by your the conversations among you all about um, the treatment with hormone where you drop the the Orgovix component and just depend on the um, the second tier anti-androgen drug. Yeah, yeah. Which allows yeah. your testosterone to recover, you get some energy back. You know, and this concept you guys have all talked about, about taking a drug holiday. Um, you know, when I asked Badami about um, the long term, she you know, uh, understandably, we had just met. She didn't know that much about me, but she didn't really have an answer. She basically said, you know, we'll do this for a while and we'll see what happens. Um, What's the longest you've ever been on uh, hormone therapy continuously? You've been on and off and on and off, but what's the longest continuous run of hormone therapy? I'd have to say... You know what? I said those Lupron shots were six months. I don't believe so. Now I, I think they were three month shots. Um, okay. Enough to cover the about a month before my radiation, the radiation itself, and then about a month afterwards. Gotcha. Um, so that would be the longest. I took bicalutamide along with the Lupron, but only while I was undergoing radiation. Yeah. So I've really yeah. only been on hormones for three months at a time at the longest and only and twice okay so you're you have uh you're playing what we call whack-a-mole here where the <laughs> cancer pops up you whack it with something you stop the treatment it pops up somewhere else you whack it with something but the overall trend is that you're starting to get metastases in other areas of your body so now Clearly, you're look, looking for a stronger and more steady, uh, uh, persistent kind of treatment. And that's just what uh, Dr. Shmulowitz is going to be an expert about. And at some point, um, you'll be able to talk about monotherapy with one drug or even drug holidays once everything is under good control. So uh, they, if you're interested in genetic testing, Rick, who uh, at least on my screen is down on the bottom. I don't know where he is on your screen. He has posted in the chat. So see in the upper right corner of your screen, there's these two square boxes. Yeah, I see it. Uh, it has the number three next to it on mine, but I don't know what yours might have. But if you click on that, you'll get comments that you can write in or that other people can write in. Right. And where it says promise link under there. Oh yeah, I see that. This is a, um, uh, these, this group is attempting to create a large database of genetic findings for prostate cancer men. And they will do your genetic testing for free uh, using a cheek swab. And uh, it doesn't tell us what the genetics of the tumor necessarily are. So, you know, sometimes your tumor has a separate mutation of its very own. And um, we call that uh, uh, somatic testing. But the kind of genetic testing where you look at the genes inherited from your parents and you could pass down to your children, Promise will do that for free. And so if you click on that link, they'll send you a package and you can get some uh, testing. You won't get results back in time 
to discuss them with Dr. Shmulowitz, but uh, you'll get, you will get some uh, some results. Well, thanks. That's awesome. I will do that. Uh, I'd like to open it up to the group because there are a number of men here who have had some very similar experiences as you are, and I think you're partly here to hear from other guys. Um, so does anybody have any uh, comments that you'd like to make? When you do the test, if you when you get the information for Promise doing their genetic test, make sure you do not say you want your doctor involved. If you don't say that, then they will send you a spit tube and you can just do it on your own. If you say okay. you want your doctor involved, they will not work that way. Okay. Um, by the way, I, I also went from, I'm 14 years in, I went from a prostatectomy to ra ra getting a radi radiologies, like 30, 35, 40 sessions. And uh, when mine came back, they put me on uh, abiraterone, which then stopped everything from happening for two and a half years. And that's why you, you, you know, it includes prednisone, but it's only five milligrams of prednisone. It's not much. You won't even feel it. But you really, abiraterone is the right price. You're not 65 yet, are you? Yes. Oh, you I'm are. Waiting. So you're on Medicare. Well, Medicare will pay for uh, enzalutamide and for abiraterone. I, it doesn't make sense that the, the doctors don't know that it would be covered. Darylutamide. Whoa, 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 Jeff. Everybody on Medicare has different plans. Just because they play, pay for you doesn't mean they'll pay for somebody else. So it all depends on his plan, his drug plan, if he's on advantage, if he isn't on advantage. So we, we can't say because you're on Medicare, you're, you're, they'll pay. Yeah, it depends. I'm on uh, classic Medicare plus sub, and I have a prescription drug plan. Right. Uh, it, right. But right. The, the, the PDP was not going to pay for the uh, enzalutamide. It was going to cost so, me thirty three hundred dollars a month. Right. So, uh, and we, we'll get into that a little bit. But the first stop I think we should make is with David Muslin because he's with Dr. Schmulowitz, and he's on monotherapy daraludamide, and he switched from another doc, and. So I think you'd be interested to hear what he's got to say. Absolutely. Uh, the, the, uh, there, while they pay, charge you 3300 a month, my Medicare has an $8,000 maximum for medic for drugs. Let, Jeff, Once Jeff, you hit that let, max, let's, Jeff let, let's get into that in a minute. Let's go okay. first of all to David, to, to David and we'll come back to the whole <laughs> issue around the drugs. Go, go ahead, David. So, so I, I love Russell Shmulowitz. He's very easy to talk to. Uh, you'll be able to collaborate with him versus him telling you what to do. And uh, he's a real pro. He's up on everything. And uh, he's the man, for, my, for me, he's the man in Chicago. And um, you'll enjoy him a lot. And I think he'll get you pointed in the right direction and get you on the right regimen of drugs and so forth. And, you know, you bounced around. You really haven't had the right met what we call a medonc, a, a GU medonc, but now you've got the right guy. So you're headed in the right direction. He's, uh, he's, he's wonderful. He's easy to talk to. He'll spend as much time with you as you need. And um, you'll get the, you've got, you now have the right doc, Jazz. Well, that's great to hear, David. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm from Chicago. I'll be back in Chicago in mid-May and happy to hook up with you anytime. Place we can go have lunch and chat. Great. Thank you. Who else tell would Russell, like to chime tell, in? Tell Russell I said hello. I love the guy. I will. <clears throat> Jim? Yes. Uh, uh, Chaz, exercise. You got to get out of the house. So I was a computer guy, too. I know exactly what it is. 45 years on the bleeding edge. But you got to get out and exercise. You really do. Even if you're tired you would be surprised if you start to exercise, you will feel a lot better. Okay. Thanks, Jim. That, that reinforces what I've been hearing. Um, 
and it's all about willpower. So, you know, it's on me. I got to get my butt moving. Thanks. And, and one last thing, Chaz, it's David again. You you bounced around. I mean, I wrote down everything you've been taking. Bounced around a lot, and you haven't been in in my own opinion. You haven't been real consistent. So, you know, I was on uh, I was on Lupron and a and a uh, I think I, I was on Lupron and and uh, Darylutamide for two years, and then I then I dropped the Lupron with with Shmulowitz's, um approval. He's got, he had, at the time, he only had me and one other guy doing that. And I was on that for 18 months. It's feeling great. And now I've taken, now I've taken a drug holiday. And um, it was interesting, guys. He also said, you know what, David? And I was doing PSA checks every 30 days. He said, don't make yourself crazy. He says, nothing's really changed that much more. He says, do it every 90 days and enjoy your time off. He's, he's, he's good like that. And he's a realist and he, and he knows, he understands. So good luck, Chaz. If you need anything, um, I'm always at these meetings. You can reach out. I'm happy to talk. Great, David. Thank you very much. So let's um, s circle back a little bit to the um, the issues around the cost of your drugs. Um, people, th this is all over the shop. But one thing that stays pretty constant is that that there's usually a maximum amount that you're going to have to pay each year. So you're not, if you see a number of $3,300, it's not like it's going to be $3,300 every month. You're going to pay $3,300 maybe until you reach a maximum. And after you reach that maximum, you're going to pay very, very, very little. Now, every drug plan has different ways in which they get to that maximum. What's interesting is that the, um, the IRA Act, the IR Act or whatever it was called, is, oh, yeah. is, is revamping that and it's reducing that maximum. So I think next year it's only going to be about $2,500. And then after that, you'll be paying very little. So don't think of it as being that's that's what your your maximum is. Do you have um, do you have an insurance broker? Do you have a Medicare insurance broker? Um, I've been with the same plan for so long. Um, no, the answer is no, I don't. OK, so you can call up whoever whose plan is it is well my my medicare supplement is blue cross blue shield of illinois okay so and you can I, call I love, up blue i love that you... my medicare and supplement you know for my regular um i i never see a bill it's only the prescription drugs that okay. where i have the, where i have the gap so who, and that's a united who... healthcare plan okay so you can call up united healthcare and have them explain to you what your <laughs> obligations are okay. this for, for 2024 and what's the most you'll be paying before you go what's called through the donut hole. The donut hole right. So you pay a certain amount of money and then there's a period where you don't pay anything and then there's another period after that where you pay a reduced amount. Now what's interesting is that what you pay and what the plan pays goes to meet those amounts. It's not just what you pay. Right. But you need, frankly, you need a broker to explain it to you, unless there's some brave person in this group right now who thinks they can do a good job explaining to you where that limit is for this, for, for, for 2024. But I, We've, we're sort of moving into a transition area, and frankly, I don't, I don't get it. But I think the take-home message is, if they're asking you for thirty-three hundred dollars for the first year of that drug, the likelihood is you won't be paying anything for the whole, for, for the rest Wait. of the year. Jeff, you're on an advantage plan, aren't you? 
Yes, and the thing is that it, it's irrelevant what plan you're on. You were right, Rick. It's what you pay plus what your the, your company pays. And I I had to pay twenty three hundred dollars for Daralumide in January, and in February it was zero dollars because okay. I'd hit the eight thousand dollar limit. Okay. So it, it, that's because the drug is twelve thousand dollars, and uh, that hit eight quick. So the, Rick said is absolutely accurate that it's it's a combination of what they pay and plus what you pay. So while you might pay thirty three hundred the first month, you probably won't. But you, uh, in fact, the second month they told me I, even though I paid twenty three hundred the first, the second month they said I have to pay thirty three hundred. And last year I was paying twelve dollars a month after the first month. I I, I got a zero dollar bill for the second month. It, it was right. done. So. It, expect that the costs aren't as going to be as high and enzalutamide you can try it if you have a lot of side effects you want to talk smaller it's into darolutamide which has many fewer side effects just something to keep in mind okay i know you this group talks a lot about darolutamide which i don't know anything about um although when i looked it up you know google told me it was for only for non-metastatic cancer but well look first of all first of all be very careful of dr google because you yeah. don't get the nuances with dr google okay exactly. non-metastatic is a non-existent category it's it's a category that was made up by bayer when they went for the approval of darolutamide mm -hmm. because they couldn't get in in, into the metastatic space and they wanted to create another space. The problem is that non-metastatic means that we don't see any metastasis using the old Technetium 99 technology. But we can, we can send you to get a scan with a PSMA and we'll see the metastasis. So I it, it it's it, it's tricky it's deceiving it's frustrated us a great deal over the years we've let bayer know that but the problem is it's sort of found its way into the lingo but in fact anybody who has recurrent disease they already have metastasis the yeah. question is where is it and can we see it right. it's not non you're not non metastatic you're metastatic but maybe we can't see it yet and and so um now certain doctors are willing to work with that other doctors are sticklers it just so happens that dr s is great so he will go to bat for you to try and get your darolutamide versus other doctors and there are guys here in this group who will tell you oh my doc couldn't get me darolutamide so you know i'm on ends or what, what have you mm -hmm. but um the reason darolutamide is different is because it doesn't cross the brain barrier so it doesn't affect the receptors in your brain and that's generally the reason why you feel better so if you can if you can live with it it's good frankly probably the best starting drug of all if you can get it in terms of longevity and sequencing is abiraterone plus prednisone okay if you can deal with it because because the drugs the other drugs are more you're more likely to have success with the other drugs if you need them later down the road after abiraterone than taking abiraterone after the other drugs okay. if that makes sense to you it does yeah i'll, I'll hand it richard tolbert has his hand up and i'm keeping an eye on the clock here as well john okay uh, chad you, you mentioned that you had been rejected um, for copay support uh for enzalutamide was that through the uh, company itself yeah through the company through Especially uh, and Pfizer. Yes. Uh, I'm on enzalutamide and Orgovix, and uh, there's an organization called the Assistance Fund that I've been able to get grants to take care 
of uh, my enzalutamide and the Orgavix, and uh, just something you might want to check out. If whatever way you go, it can help with your copay. Okay, thank you, Richard. I think I have. Jazz here. Go ahead. I just, I just saying, I think I have the information for that group. Oh, good. Uh, Chaz, it, um, we would uh, love to have you come back. I guess Jim will probably make you come back. <laughs> You're probably already familiar with our schedule, first and third Mondays, second and fourth Tuesdays. And uh, we'd love to have you back, hear how your consultation goes, what medication eventually gets picked for your second line drug, and, and how that uh, little, um, how that small PSA uh, gets to be used to follow your treatment. Okay. Thank you. Thank you guys for the, all the time and the input. And uh, I will definitely be back. Absolutely. Okay. I've learned great. more if... in the last month listening to these meetings than I have in the last 10 years. So I know I'm in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you uh, put your email in that chat? We email. have it, John. We yeah, have it. Already. Yeah. I yeah, okay. have uh, emailed Rick. So I'm on the mailing list. So. Okay. Great. I'm going to start moving down the list unless anybody can we just can, can we do a very quick plug at this point in time for a couple of things. So go ahead. Yes. Just, um, we have a great group to talk about everything except treatment Chaz, which is called men speaking freely. Um, and um, that meets twice a month. I can't remember if I signed you up for it. If I did and you don't want to be in there don't want to get those reminders and see the wise words that people like Dr. John and, 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 and Rich Jackson write, don't unsubscribe because it'll take you off of everything. <laughs> Just go to the website and where it says uh, join a group, you can change everything there or let Jim know or let me know and we'll change it. But we recommend, we do recommend that group. Whilst I'm on the subject of um, other meetings. Um, tomorrow night, I'll put the link in the chat window. Tomorrow night, we're doing another solo arts heal. And I'm mentioning this especially for Herb Courtney, because um, the lady is a world class, national class storyteller. She has a husband who has Parkinson's. And she's going to tell the story about her driving around a racetrack with him in an orange Corvette. So I think this should be a really good meeting. We're, we're, we're excited about it. And um, anybody else who has any Parkinson's friends um, or MS friends, I think, uh, oh, Dennis Career, it'll, that'll suit you, Dennis. That, that'll be a good one for you. And if, what time it'll start here at um, 7.30 is the start time in, on, on, if you're on Pacific or Mountain Standard Time, it's, uh, it's, it's going to be 7.30. And I'll, I'll put the information in there. And the last thing I wanted to do whilst I've got everybody here is give a huge big shout out to Captain Jim Marshall. Not because yet, Rick. Not yet, please. You'll steal my thunder. Oh, do you ask for time? Yes, okay. he's going to get time. And he he's won't let anybody get... talk about it until then. Okay, well, then we won't, we won't, but hang in because our thoughts and our prayers are all with you, Captain Jim. I'm going to go okay. on to uh, Thomas Matika. Tom, Thomas, are you at your computer? Thomas must have stepped out. Uh, let's go to Herb Courtney. Yeah, hi. Um, hi. I could probably find an answer to this if I poked around the internet a lot, but like, like Rick said, I don't put a lot of stock in Dr. Google. Um, the question is, does anybody know of, of any uh, upcoming scans or treatments um, to detect METs 
for those people whose prostate cancer does not express PSMA. I think your best bet is the uh, FDG scan or the Oximant scan. Am I right, everybody? The, those are two good options. Um, probably Axiomin is going to be a little more accurate than the than the FDG PET, I think. Len, what would you say? This is really... And I've already had it. Well, <clears throat> yeah, it depends on uh, how quickly the cancer is growing. If it's growing rapidly, there there's a good chance the FDG scan will be the one you want because cancer cells require lots of glucose, which is what the FDG scan is doing. Uh, <clears throat> However, it's, if it's very slowly growing, there won't be much difference between the uptake of the cancer cell versus any other cell that also needs glucose. Um, <clears throat> so other than that, yeah, the axiomin would probably be more sensitive. Even a choline scan, is, that's also a uh, metab metabolic scan, which means uh, actively growing cells like cancer cells will take up a choline uh, what was it, uh, 11 choline? I don't remember what the... I C11. C11, right, C11 choline. <clears throat> Wait, I don't know where you... Oh, you're in California. Yeah, uh, and, yeah you... and my cancer... My, my, my cancer is very slow. It's very receptive to uh, darolutamide or, or most, you know, uh, Lupron, any of that stuff. So... Right now I'm sitting at 0 0.03 PSA, but I've had, you know, I've allowed purposely, we've allowed my PSA to get as high as seven. And during that progression up, I've had the, both the, um, uh, what is it? The two uh, prominent PSMA scans with the CRT or CT scan. I've had the, the, um, prostate specific MRI. I've had the axiom. Everything's negative. So I'm, I'm just trying to see, you know, we can't really do much except the, the ADT because we don't know where it is. And I'm just trying to see if there was anything on the horizon that uh, would be different. And since I obviously don't express PSMA. PSMA. PSMA, right. Right. So there, there are things on the horizon. Um, there are other proteins that they're working on that are expressed by prostate cancer. And Len may remember the name of them. Um, I'm trying to, uh, I'm sort of digging around in the back of my mind. There's one in particular that they often Go talk about. Go to tape. Not the Dota Tate, no. There's one that's that not that's more specific to that's specific to prostate cancer. It's not an NEC. It's not a neuroendocrine protein. Um, I'm trying to remember what it's called, but that there, there are, but there's nothing that's sort of really hit the market. If I can find it, I'll put it in or I'll send it to you, Herb. Um, okay. That said, there are proteins that are common see that may be common in um in morphed small cell neuroendocrine type cancer um dotatate is one of those um dll3 is another one that they're looking at right now and and these are all targets if we think your cancer is morphed and is not responsive but that's probably not your case. You're you're just one of the twenty percent of people that don't express PSMA. Yep, yep. Um, because you're still responsive to the darolutamide, and yep. and if you if you if you weren't, then we might be looking for the, the dotatate or the DLL3 or something else. 
Okay, well, that's encouraging. <laughs> Bob McHugh, did you want to make your point verbally before I move on? It, his uh, mic is not working. Oh, okay. Well, Bob uh, wrote in Herb that he had an axiom scan at 0.5 PSA, which is a good deal higher than your PSA, and it did find a lesion in the prostate bed. Yeah. Well, like I said, I had an axiom, and it it it, it was at a, I don't re remember the exact PSA, but it was <clears throat> during that period when we allowed my PSA to go clear up to seven. So it was up, you know, in the in the whole numbers for sure. And it came up negative as well. Yeah. Um, I'm going to check again with Thomas. I think I saw your mic come on, Thomas. Are you back? Yes, I'm here. OK. Want to tell us what you wanted to bring up tonight? Yeah, uh, I'm getting closer to adding a second ADT to my treatment. I've been on uh, Permagon, uh, Degarelix, if that's how you say it, uh, since October. And my, my PSA uh, came down from 84 to undetectable in about two or three uh, sessions. And it's staying, it's staying down low for right now. Uh, there's just a lot of... Uh, a lot of red, a lot of red tape here in terms of getting on this second. I have abiraterone all set to go and approved by my United Healthcare uh, Plan G, uh, so that's here. But I've been trying to, uh, because of, of course, the uh, wonderful talk about darolutamide in the group. I thought, well, this sounds sounds good to me, you know, and uh, I'd like to do that. The cost became an issue. So I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to do it because of the cost. So I dug around in that for a while. And then uh, the other issue was, as was mentioned in this evening's meeting, the, uh, the way that drug was approved and uh, also mixed in with that is what Rick said about it and about how the doctors, some being flexible and some not being flexible. So th this really got me confused. I thought, well, you know, what, am I going to use it or not? I didn't, uh, I didn't mention this with my doc when I saw my doc at OHSU, my GU. And uh, so I got, I got pretty turned around on that. However, I did talk to her today. And uh, it, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, it's, it sounds like, according to her, I explained all this to her. And she said, she said no. I thought, well, you have to use uh, docetaxel with the uh, darolutamide. Uh, that's the way it says on the FDA site. Some of that was quoted this evening here too, you know, the way they, uh, the way uh, Rick explained it and the way they quoted it on the FDA website. I thought, no, I, I'm metastatic. I'm metastatic, hormone sensitive, but so I have to take docetaxel. And the answer to that from my doctor is no, I'm not gonna have to take it. And we can use, we can use darolutamide by itself as a second treatment and so uh, that that's that was really good news because that that stopped me from spinning about that issue and at the same time i'm filling out applications for uh, bayer's patient assistance program which uh which will pick up the uh the whole tab of the darolutamide since my uh my united healthcare will not pay for it uh, and they they give me some uh, some of that uh, 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 you know a convoluted explanation out of the Medicare handbook and uh, about approved drugs and out of the uh, you know references out of all these medical manuals. I mean, just a bunch of nonsense to me. So I ho hopefully we're going to move ahead and get that approved. If the if the uh, if Bayer doesn't come through and give that to me for free, it sounds like they they are probably going to do it. As soon as I get the application in, um, uh, I'm going to go with the abiraterone and the prednisone. So I, I feel good about all of this. It was uh, it was quite the struggle going running around in circles between all of these agents here, but it looks like it's working out for me, and that's where I stand right now. And I've got the application staring me in the face here, and I've just got to get it back to OHSU. They're very helpful there, Dr. Sokolova is very hopeful. Uh, I mean, 
she kind of shocks me. Every time I talk to her, she's quoting uh, uh, trials and studies and things like this. You know, she really does seem to keep up on her homework on, on this uh, uh, on this in this area. And uh, so uh, I'm quite I'm quite positive about, uh, you know, it's, it's been a, quite a while to get to this point. But it's, well, Thomas, it's, yeah, Thomas, you know, um, I mean, she knows Sokolova, she knows a lot more about this question than I do. Um, and I would be interested in what the guys think about this. I think that if I was in your spot and I had their lutamide sitting on the table at my right hand and abiraterone sitting on my table at the left hand, I think I would pick up the abiraterone first. Even if the darolutamide was right there on the table and available, it's 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 funny um, that you say that, Doctor John, because I was going to say much the same thing. Look, th there are two issues that we we really have to think about here. The first is how effective are the drugs we're taking, and the second is what are the side effects of the drugs. Now. We probably, we can say we we know, Len may correct me, or Dr. John, but I think the trials would all suggest that abiraterone followed by darolutamide is, is, is probably going to give you a lot more longevity. Now, if you haven't tried the abiraterone, you don't know how it's going to affect you. If it doesn't affect if it doesn't affect you badly, then you stick with it. I see Jeff March; he's got his hand up because he's got stories on, on on this. But at the point in time that you have to move to a second drug, yeah, we think darolutamide is a much better drug than 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 apalutamide or enzalutamide in terms of side effects. And again, there's evidence for that. But as John says, when you're starting off, we should be going for what we think will give you the biggest bang for your buck, which is probably starting off with abiraterone, if you can tolerate it. So I, I, I would endorse that. Jeff, what, what did you want to say about that? Because, Well, the exact same thing, Rick. I, I was on abiraterone for two and a half years. It kept my PSA down. It was only undetectable one time in two and a half years. But switching from that to darolutamide, I've been undetectable the last four months in a row. So you really should, uh, Abby is a really good starting point and it gives you more time because I had two and a half years and now I've got another six months. Whereas you, your body gets resistance to the drugs and you you don't want to get resistance to darolutamide before you've been able to have a chance to try both. Okay, I've, I've got a comment here. Uh, and of course, this is a this is assuming that you all you all understand that I am currently on my first ADT, the Firmagon. I'm going to stay <laughs> on that and then add the second one. Also, right. also the uh, uh, you know, I'm going to, I talked to the people at Bayer today and uh, I can put in this application for their patient assistance program. And they told me that there's, there's no rush. There's no, they're not going to, you know, uh, force me to make a decision and then pull my application. She said that will stay on file so that if you do get approved, if I do get approved, I don't have to use it. Also, I may not get approved. So the, the darolutamide will be out of the picture anyway, and I appreciate what you're telling me here. It's why I'm in this group. I mean, this is it. This is the, this is the proof of the concept of going to this group for me. <laughs> Just you guys talking like this. Uh, Tom, I'm going to move on if you're done. Is that it, Thomas? Yeah, yeah, but just call me Thomas I, from now on. I got to get out of that habit. I, it's a hard <laughs> habit. I don't know why it's a hard habit. <laughs> hey, Jack, I got you next on the list. Thank you very Bye. much, guys. Okay, Thank Thomas. You, John. I, I, <clears throat> thanks, John. I was at the Sloan Kettering in New York yesterday, and I, uh, every four months I either make contact in person or 
telehealth. And uh, I didn't ask too many questions, but he had a lot of things to tell me. First thing he told me, which was new because nobody's been telling me this, is he wants after my having been on um, double therapy for one year, which will be coming up in two months. Uh, it'll be two. Year, it'll be one year on both. Uh, he wants me to get an FDG scan, and I said, "Why is that?" And he said, "Because we want you to preemptively see if there's anything observable, rather than wait for the PSA to rise or for you to get symptomatic, and that way you can approach it the way you've approached it in the past with whack-a-mole SBRT." Once again, I guess that makes sense. He believes in that. He thinks it's useful that I went through that, and uh, as did Peter Carroll. So they concurred on that. Uh, I just wasn't uh, told by my doctor down here that an FDG scan was something in the offering that would be useful to get after one year. What are your thoughts about that? Uh, I'm, I'm curious. Have you all um, thought about getting an FDG scan after one year, or did you do that when you were after one year of a, of a doublet therapy? Me. No comment. Well, I, I mean, I'll I'll say something if 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 nobody wants to speak up. But yeah, I mean, we we recommend and have done for years that you get a scan once a year to monitor your your status and. Hopefully you, you get it with the same um, scan that you got the previous year so that you can compare. So this isn't anything new. I mean, yeah, we, 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 we think it's a good idea to get scanned once a year. If you had an FDG PET a year ago, you should get an FDG PET now. If you didn't get an FDG PET a year ago, but you got a PSMA, you need an FDG and a PSMA now so that you can make make the comparisons. Well, I've had FDG. I've had FDG before and Axinum and Choline and and two, two PSMAs, so I've had them all so they can compare it. Okay, that's number one. Number two is that he, he also told me, I asked him, well, he said to me, you're going to have to stay on this medication for the rest of your life. I said, wait a moment, can I take a break after two years? He said, well, you can. He said, but, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're risking uh, your, 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 your chances of living longer are much greater if you stay on the medication unless you have side effects that become overwhelming or you right. cannot tolerate the quality of Jack. life. Becomes... What? Jack. Yes, Rick. You know what we think of your doctor, right? You know what we think of your doctor. You so when you come back with information like that, that's well, why we say switch your doctor. Well, right? okay, I, it's different, yeah, but, and I, uh, I, I want to share it. Is, it was yesterday, it me, and it, it generates a certain level of anxiety when he does Of course. That. Okay, these are rule books. Of course, particular. but let me ask you a question. Why ask the hell did question. you schlep all the way up to Because Memorial I want to maintain my Kettering. relationship with Sloan Kettering because of Sloan Kettering. Capisce? But it, but it isn't right. Sloan Kettering, it's Danila. And we but know Danila... We know Danila has a bad rap in Ancan. I mean, Len has just gotten off the call, unfortunately, but he tell you the same thing. He right. switched away from Danila. Here's the I'm thing. Not gonna, I'm not going to dump Don't, long don't bring, it drives me a little nuts when we say to go, we say to you and you know what we think of certain doctors. And then you come back and you say, well, this doc's making me crazy. No shit, shit. No, I didn't say he's making me crazy. I'm telling you what he told me. All right, so He's giving you anxiety. Oh, well, well, wait, let's let's, let's, let's talk one at a time. Giving you anxiety, because... right? Can I share it, or am I going to be shut off because you don't like Danila and I don't like Danila? You know, he's a he's a good guy. He, he's a stickler. He sticks by the rigidity of his rules, which is the next thing he came up with, which he told me. I said, "Can I go on darolunamide after two years?" He said, absolutely not. That has not been proven. That's okay. only a study. That's off-label, blah, 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 blah. This is I'm not a good use of the group's time. This is not a good use of the group's time. Other moderators, why? Because this is coming from a doctor that we don't have confidence in, who gives you anxiety, who makes us crazy. If we go to other doctors, then we get, we get different answers. 
what is the point of talking about Danila in this group? It doesn't do us good. It doesn't do you good. And frankly, Jack, I got to say, why put yourself in that position? You're doing it to yourself. We can't say anything to you. What do we think? It's all a bunch of crap. Why? Because we don't particularly like Danila and we don't think he's a great doc and we don't think he gives good advice. So I don't know what else to say to you. Well, I have to run it past you again. He, like he recommended Zometa over Prolia, and he recommends I get on it right now because, you know, even though I only have mild osteopenia. Yeah. So I, again, wanted to talk about it because who am I going to talk about it? Two weeks from now, three weeks from now, I'll see, I'll see Belusic, and I'll ask him about all of this stuff. So okay, he, but in the meantime, what, what if, if I can't yeah. share it here, what can I do? Rick, okay. Rick, just, just let Jack vent for a minute, Rick, because he's, Jesus he's, he's Christ. not Christ. I mean, you're cutting me off at the knees, Rick. I mean, I need a little support. The guy tells me something makes me anxious. I'm supposed to shut the fuck up because you don't like him? I mean, you know, he upsets me. Yes, true. Am I supposed to ditch him? It's hard to do because I still want to maintain an alliance with Sloan Kettering. 21 years I've been with Sloan Kettering, and I don't want to ditch them. Okay, he may eventually leave, and I may be able to latch on to someone else if necessary. Okay? Okay, that's it. You don't want to hear any more? Fuck it. I just don't want to raise the temperature of the room very much. No, I now. mean, well, I, you know, I started off slow. I mean, look. Yeah, yeah, I, I know, I know. Rick. We we have. Christ, I often talk, I don't see the point in running two dots, and I've had this discussion. I've had it with other people in the group. I won't name names. If you've got a doc that you like, unless you need a second opinion for something in particular, then what's the point of running two docs together? Tell, You're only going to run you yourself point. in trouble you and make point. yourself crazy. Here's my second point, thing is, if you're going to get a second opinion, get it from somebody who you respect right, and whose Rick, opinion you respect. Rick, they got the best readers in the country outside of California. Bullshit. Well, it's bullshit. Just because it's MSKCC, it doesn't mean they're the best no, in the country. They have good readers. It's the doctor, not the institution. Well, and who, and who do they have left there? They've got Dana Radcock, who we like, who is good. We can trust her. They've got, they've got, they've got, they've got, they've got uh, Morris. Um, Larry Fish will talk to you about his doc, who is probably pretty good. But they've also got docs who aren't good. But and you know, when, when you come to us and you talk to us time and time again about Danila this, Danila that, Danila the other, and you know we don't have a lot of respect for what Danila says, and then you come and say Danila's making me crazy because he's giving me anxiety, we say, no shit Sherlock. No shit Sherlock. And to me, it's just not, it's not a good use of the time to bring back what Danila says to this group. I, huh. I don't see it. All right. Well, well, I'm maintaining that relationship because I do believe there are better right. readers, there are better okay, readers gonna... up there than down here. I, I've seen that in action. That's what I want to maintain. So as a result, I have to maintain a relationship with him because he gets things read for me. And they do read things that they're not able to read quite as accurately as they read. Okay. They read them more accurately up here than down here. And I just, you know, I think they're very good readers. And it helped me in terms of my diagnosis. Because okay. they had trouble finding it for five years. Remember, five years they couldn't find it. They okay, it guys. Out. They didn't find okay. it. Okay. How about the can it here? You both are wasting our time. We All have right. other things to talk about. I'm out of here. Jack, I understand what you're doing, but you are confusing me because all of a sudden I think you are talking about an expert, and now I start to question what I've heard, and then all of a sudden everybody knows, and it is confusing to a, a bunch of us. And I understand your position about maintaining up there. Okay? I'm sorry you're confused. I'm well, confused too. Okay. Let's uh, let's drop that for now. Yeah. Um, maybe we can get back to Jack and Jim. While well, you've got the floor, do you want to make your announcements, please? Oh, 
Okay, I have a story to tell. Okay, treatment wise, treatment wise, our abiraterone and Lupron for five years, I have been a strong proponent of exercise. Exercise on the bike, aerobic exercise, handled it extremely well. Treatment holiday, I volunteer uh, two days a week, essentially at a thrift store. I come home a little tired. Okay, cool. I'm about 79, pushing 80. I think I'm good. I feel good, everything else. Well, at the thrift store, I had to do stairs. Okay, fine. There's about 24 stairs. I get up about seven stairs and I can hardly breathe. I mean, it was a shock. Wait a minute. I've been exercising on the bike. I go out no problems at all but now all of a sudden stairs are just just about to kill me so i have to rest i go up another six or eight stairs i gotta rest well that's in the trade i call a clue so i go to a primary care doc i am referred to a referred to the cardiologist I get the stress test, I get the nuclear stress test, and I'm told I need two stents. Okay, fine. So a week ago, I go in and now stents, I understand, you know, up through the leg, no, it goes up through the wrist now. It was, it was a, a piece of cake until the guy is there all of a sudden, he says, Jim, and we, how about to look at the screen? And I happen to look over and there's about a, about a flat screen or 80 inch there. And he happens to point out that I've got three areas. I have a artery that's 90% blocked, a small one, can't stent it. I got another one, 99% small one, he can't stent it. I have a branch off of a big one and it's right at the junction. And he says, not such a good idea. And he backs out. So I was scheduled at oh dark 30 in the morning, oh 500 tomorrow, but I got bumped until Thursday, a triple bypass. Okay, the long and the short of this is I hear folks ADT, I don't want to exercise. Okay, fine. I say exercise, but it has to be the right kind of exercise. Even though I was I was then on the bicycle aerobic exercise, not really the kind where I do essentially a hundred miles. Colonel Jordan does it, but no just out exercising. So the long and the short is, I would advise anybody that has a chance to do stairs and not just four or five, you know, I go upstairs, but seriously try it and see what happens because that was the thing that happened to get me. And if I wouldn't have done those stairs, I would have never known it. So, I'm scheduled for a triple bypass and um, Thursday here, and I am all set to do it. So as I said, the moral of the story, I got snookered. And I think a lot of other guys could get snookered too. So hopefully you will try to take stairs i mean some serious ones and find out how you are doing that's the moral of the story so my thunder <laughs> who who's had a coronary artery bypass graft here oh nobody i'm surprised boy i am surprised too of course you may not know that because I didn't know it until I just said 90, 90, and 99. Hello. Yeah. 
I've had a lot of friends who um, had them done, and I know vascular surgeons. And if you have a chance, make sure yeah. they have mammary arteries. Absolutely. I already had a, a fellow through essentially the veterans group. There is a lady, a nurse, Lieutenant Colonel. Her son is a perfusionist, which I'm like, what the hell is a perfusionist? It's the person that knows the heart machine. And it turns out it's a small world. So her son called up here, okay, at the Virginia Hospital Center to check with their perfusionist. And he said, you got no problems. So it's real interesting about who you know. So I think I'm okay. I'm sure you're going to be okay. Rick, you, you, uh, you had something further to say to Jim, didn't you? Oh, just that, that uh, we, we wish you all the best. And, you know, we were very fortunate having this perfusionist contact. And when a perfusionist gives you an opinion, it's very different from uh, getting opinion from another doc because these guys have to operate the heart-lung machines whilst the docs are operating. So they have a different view of everything. And, and he's strongly endorsed. Um, I did, uh, you know, I, I, I do know because I've had for other friends who have had open heart surgery that the recovery can be pretty lengthy. Um, it can oftentimes come with depression, which um, I don't know why, but it does. So if there's anybody who has direct experience, um, we, we, we'd like it. You have a couple of hands up, Dr. John. Both of the Jeffs are at their hands up. Could I have Dr. Jeff first? Did you have a comment? Yeah, uh, yeah. so I'd like to make a suggestion. Rather than challenging ourselves with stress tests, like walking upstairs or riding a bike, which in given instances can prove fatal. Uh, you know, if you've got blockage and, and you stress yourself, you could have a heart attack, go into ventricular fib, but why not get a uh, coronary calcium scan, which is really non-invasive. It's an easy test to have, and it shows how much calcium is blocking the arteries. Uh, how much plaque buildup is is in the uh, coronary arteries, calcified plaque. And so that doesn't put us at any risk as opposed to doing a stress test, self-stress test. Um, a scan, is that like a blood test or a scan scan? It's a scan. It's a scan. Ooh. Yep. I never even heard of it. Thank you very much. Yeah, the I other name you, you may you, you may have heard the other name cardiac CT scan. It's the same as a coronary calcium scan. Thank you very much. I don't want to kill anybody. <laughs> <laughs> calcium in the coronary arteries. By the way, the coronary arteries are what carries blood from the bottom of the aorta to the actual muscles of the heart. The heart doesn't get its oxygen from the blood it pumps. It gets it from the coronary arteries. And if there's calcium in those arteries, it's a, I guess, we, I guess you could call it a biomarker for atherosclerotic plaques, like Dr. Jeff says. Right. You might have to pay for it yourself, but it's not very expensive. Excuse me, John, a question about EKGs. I've had numerous EKGs showing nothing. Everything was okay. Yeah. Well, you haven't, you don't have any ischemia going on now. In, uh, in other words, your heart is getting all the blood that it's asking for now, and you don't have a history of heart attacks, and you don't have any conduction abnormalities in your heart, so your cardiogram is normal, even though you need a triple bypass. Fair enough, Jeff? Cool. Thank you, Jeff immensely. Jeff Markey? Yeah, you know, a lot of 
people with prostate cancer die of heart attacks rather than prostate cancer. Abiraterone in particular is very hard on the heart. Jim has had five years of it. I've had two and a half, and I've had three major AFib events since then. And if I wasn't on blood thinner, I might have had a stroke. Be, be aware that the drugs we take have a direct effect on our hearts. And you want to not maybe that scan and others. I, I, I also, EKG never shows anything when I have any, unless I'm right in AFib. But there, it's something to be wary of that the drugs we take can cause major heart issues. Excuse me, Jeff. How does that drug plug up the heart, or or are you talking about plugging it up, or just it's stressing the heart? It weakens the heart somewhat. That's okay. The well, I got plugs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I saw those. <laughs> there's there's uh, some information about how that the drugs we take can cause our arterial sclerosis, and that can lead to other issues. If you're plugged, that's that's could be. Our, I'm not sure if it's arterial arterial sclerosis or not, but it's one of the things the drugs we take can cause. Well, or me, it's uh, supposedly Agent Orange, but the way that I'm, I will try to play it is that after my treatment holiday is over, I want to switch off of Lupron, Orgavix. And to me, that is a perfect example of hard on the heart now, you know, a triple bypass, I don't want to stress it anymore. So I'll see how it flies. Larry, you got your hand up? Yes, is my, is there, there, I, finally my microphone is working. I had to switch my computers. I yeah, we can hear you fine. I have an interesting side uh, light information about uh, the calcium score scan. Um, I'm, a, I'm a runner uh, and I live here in Phoenix and there's a local mountain that's about a mile, mile and a quarter high. I used to climb that regularly as just fun exercise. And I worked in a hospital, a nine story high. And a lot of times I'd take the stairs all the way up instead of the, uh, the uh, elevator. So uh, eight years ago, I had a calcium score scan and it's no big deal. But the big deal for me was, although the different categories of is it good, not so good, bad, is zero is best and then it goes to 100 200 300 400 is really bad mine was eight over 1800 and here i am still eight years later i'm not running like i used to because of my uh, other issues but uh, i have a history of running a lot so i think i had put money in my physical bank cardiac bank mm -hmm. to help me maybe i created other uh, uh, bypasses on my own when I was young. Okay, that's all. Larry, Larry did you follow that up with a uh, with another test after that calcium scan? Um, no other test was done other than uh, seeing my cardiologist. Uh, he immediately put me on a torvastatin, and, and um, the highest that my total cholesterol ever had been was like two hundred four. And it really knocked the daylights out of that, brought me down to about 145 uh, with my HDL going up and my LDL going down. Um, and that brings me to a question, too. Uh, I've, I think I've heard that a being on ADT tends to cause your statin drugs to not be as effective. Hmm. And just uh, a couple months ago, they did double my dose of atorvastatin. And... Um, Anyway, so, the, the, and, and, and I have had other, you know, uh, echocardiograms and a couple of uh, nuclear uh, stress tests, too. Okay. But the doctor says that it would do no good. There's no point in doing another uh, uh, calcium score scan. He said it's not going to change. It is what it is because that calcium is just there. 
but uh, it's surprising that with 400 being a terrible high and mine's over 1800 <laughs> it's amazing uh, i don't have any uh, known side effects either uh difficulties larry well you got to do this you know. Well, you've got the floor. Why don't you catch us up a little bit? It's been a couple well, hold, of years. Hold on, John. Hold, hold on. John Kish wanted to get in, I think, on this conversation. Did you have something you wanted to say, John? Are you there? John Kish? John's not yet. If John's not there, Rick, I'd like to get on. This is Henry. I'm on the phone. Hi, Henry. D did you want oh, Did you want I, to come in on this conversation too? Because John Kish is also on the yeah. phone. Yes. Um, I spoke to you before. I um after I had my uh, RP surgery. I uh, five months later I had a cardiac event. Uh, unknown to me that I had even any type of cardiac problems. I um went walking one morning and um me and my buddy have as a walking crew we decided we want to take off and run. I started to run and I got dizzy all of a sudden and um decided I better go home. Got in the truck, started to go home, passed out. Um we had a truck at car accident uh, right there in front of the park. My friends and neighbors came to the rescue there and um I uh I have what they call the AV second degree block. AV block is uh, some type of sinus block. I didn't know I had any type of uh, cardiac uh, problems. I um, was very athletic in the service, ran five miles every morning, I had law enforcement. I ran, trained always, treadmill, steppers, you name it, <laughs> tracks. Um, and the next thing I know, I'm in the hospital getting a pacemaker. Uh, my heart rate dropped pretty low. Um, I guess down to 30 maybe. And um, that was in July, July 18th. So for, I'm here now. I have a unknown reason, condition, but I have a pacemaker now. Mm -hmm. That's my story, I guess. Yeah. You guys know there's a whole branch of cardiac these these days cardio oncology and um, you can even get a, a heart specialist who's also a specialist in cardiac consequences of uh, cancer um, the cancer itself the treatments you know women with breast cancer getting radiation that affects their hearts and so uh, uh, Rick and I have met a couple of these guys a couple of years ago. I think we even had an interview uh, uh, that we recorded. So it's a whole new specialty. Um, John Kish, are you are you with us at this point? Oh yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. You 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 were trying to yeah. get in. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, no, this is different circumstances, but my mother was a nurse, and she was a chain smoker, and then she had three uh, open heart surgery three times. She kept smoking, so that kept clogging her arteries, but there was a complimentary uh, doctor that did chelation therapy. It's expensive, but it cleans out all the the veins in your body besides just the heart, and you know, and, that, and then complementary, there's a lot of supplements that are called chelating that help, like aspirin's chelating that um, keep the blood um, from whatever clogging. I don't, I'm not an expert, but uh, with a complementary medicine that you'll have to pay out of your own pocket, there's a lot of stuff you could take uh, for heart. You know, I'm not a doctor, I just know from life experience. So there's a lot of stuff out there and you know, I don't know if it works, but it helped for my mother, chelation therapy. I don't know if you ever heard that. It's really expensive, though. Uh, okay, that's about it. But my mother went quit smoking, and she had real bad diabetes, so that her heart kept clogging up again. You know what I mean? But it yeah. was in the early days of uh, bypass surgery, just when they started doing it, you know. Um, How, that's pretty much what, it. 
Yeah. John, John Kish, what year was that? Do you remember? Cause it I, was, I, I, yeah. Yeah, 1985, she had it. I know. So Yeah, that was like the early days of it. And well, um, I they're really, really good talk, at it now. Yeah. I can really talk about the early days because my uncle had a bypass surgery at the National Heart Hospital in London in 1969. And it had it wow. 13 hours uh, to, to do, I think, a single bypass. That, that was... That was really the early days. Um, I, I want to just come back to Larry. And Larry, you know, you say that um, you've heard that ADT can um, can make your statins less effective. Um, I don't think they make the statins less effective. I think what happens is that they... Um, are more likely to to raise your cholesterol so you may need more or different statins it isn't that the statins are less effective it's that you may not be taking enough statins whilst you're on the ADT because the metabolic syndrome and I'm not exactly sure one of the docs on the call can probably explain it but the metabolic syndrome gives rise to um, more plaque in your in your arteries mm -hmm. and, and this is one of the problems of ADT so we see a rise in cholesterol we see a rise in sugar we see more belly fat and this is all a result of not having testosterone in your body Dr. John do you, do you, do you want to amplify on that at all uh, no, I yeah I agree. I, I it it doesn't exactly interfere with the statin, but it may cause a series of events that raise your risk level and might even raise your uh, need for more statins. I see a number of uh, of questions about hearts in the chat. I think a lot of this is directed to Jim Marshall, but I'm not sure. Jeff Markey had a comment about echocardiograms, which Jim answered. I don't know if that was addressed to Jim, probably. Rick has brought up his comment about metabolic syndrome. And Bob McHugh asked about, is an EKG advisable? And mentioned that he had three stents himself. Uh, Bob also asked where the cardiac cath was done. That probably was addressed to Jim Marshall. Yes, it is at Virginia Hospital Center. The guy does eight of them a day, three days a week. It was like a Swiss watch in there. It was amazing. Um, Harry, is Harry still on the call? Yep. Oh, there you are. Hi. Harry, you had something to bring up tonight. Yeah, just um, looking for everyone's opinion on something. Um, my last oncologist uh, appointment, he um, asked what I thought about going on a uh, drug holiday. And basically my answer at the time was, I don't know. Um, and that's because the last drug holiday I had um, resulted in to lesions on my spine. So um, while the idea is appealing, based on what happened to me last time, you know, I have some concerns. I've been on ADT treatment now for three years since since that happened, the reoccurrence. And um, for one year of that, it was a combination um, therapy. And then the past couple of years, it's only been duralutamide, which has been you know, a much more pleasant experience than uh, being on Zolodex and and Daralutamide combined. I mean, that just wiped me out. I couldn't handle it. Um, so anyhow, it's been three years, and she asked, and I said I didn't know, and she said, well, let's discuss it again at your next appointment, which is going to be coming up. And, uh, you know, I've read different information on this, nothing particularly um, involving darolutamide in this respect, but 
um, I, I just have a, a little, little anxiety about doing this again and then ending up with more, you know, lesions on my spine as a result. So, um, just curious if anyone has any opinion or thoughts on it. Who's your doc? I'll go. Are you still seeing? Are you still seeing Shmulewitz, Harry? I see Hussein. You see Hussein. That's right. That's right. Um, you know, I just for for me personally, I needed a break. It was three and a half years, and he looked at me and he said, "Look, that's fine. We'll just keep, we'll we'll just keep checking your PSA, and if something pops up, we'll zap it with uh, SBRT." And um, and I had a couple lesions on my ribs, and we zapped it at, at Northwestern with SBRT, and it was they were gone. So, you know, it's a personal decision. For me, it was a personal decision to take that risk. And I was also a little bit scared. But um, I'll tell you, it's nice to take a fucking break. Sorry to, sorry to swear. <laughs> but um, that's that. So that for me, it was my own personal decision, Harry. But I, I hear you, and I understand your fear. Yeah. Uh, Harry, I think... Um, the, the, the issue is to keep a close watch along the way. So you don't, don't go on a break and just because your PSA is low, um, you don't do scans once a year or what have you, you've really got to monitor it. But yeah, if you're feeling good and you're monitoring it, we, we did do that, Rick, the last time. And did you? My PSA was very low. Um, and I still had two lesions. I mean, by the time we found that the lesions had developed, it was 0.5. So, you know, I'm of the belief that when you have these low PSAs, you know, it's still doing its dirty work in there, um, maybe at a slower rate. But, you know, okay. I had the lesions zap too with SBRT. They don't disappear. I mean, they, you know, it, uh, you know, they, they're, they're still there, but um, they're not growing or anything. So, so let, let me ask you, yeah. when you did this last time, where was PSMA technology? Was it, it was, was it readily available or, no, or it wasn't? No, no, it wasn't available. Then. So, I mean, today, if I were doing it, then... I would do it on the basis of doing regular PSMA scans. But don't you have to have a certain level of PSA to have, for that to be effective? Not really, because it, because because what it's picking up, you have to have a certain level of PSA if we're looking for something, and 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 you you don't have a history. So if you don't have a history, they say, yeah, you know we really want to see your PSA get up to somewhere around 0 0.2. Although now it may be even 0 0.15. You know, there's that D'Amico paper that came out last year that suggests that you start looking even when your PSA is under 0 0.2. But if you have lesions that are there in your body, they make PSMA, so they're going to get picked up. The reason they say you need to be at point two is because we don't think you're going to have any lesions if you're under point two. But in your case, where you know from your history that you may make lesions and you don't produce a lot of PSA, then we may see something. Yeah, you that's, know, like that's, my, that's, that's my point, though. I mean, the last time I dropped these lesions, my PSA was so low. Um, and I got lesions anyhow, so. But we would have uh, seen them. We would have I, seen we, those we, lesions if we, we did we, PSMA scans, even though your PSA have, was low. Rick, Rick, we did have scans, and that's how we saw them. But not PSMA. We saw we, they were picked up with, um, uh, I forget what's it, Aximan scan. Right. But and a bone and a bone scan, nuclear bone right. scan. So but, it, we we did do the scans, but my PSA had started rising it was only 0.04 then 0.05 right. and then i think it was at 0.3 what, what i'm saying is we we didn't you didn't see them on the scans that you were doing 
But if you would have done a PSMA scan at that point in time, even with low PSA, you might have seen them because if the lesions were there, and no, if they you did, they did see them, Rick, they did. That's what I'm they saying. Saw, they saw them on the PSMA scan. No, Aximan, Aximan, and a, and okay. a nuclear bone scan. And 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 what level was your what level was your PSA at that at that point? Point five. Right. So if you did, if you would have had PSMA technology and you were doing PSMA scans every three months for argument's sake, we might have seen something very, very early on. The yeah, fact is... Is PSMA testing every three months even, I mean, will insurance yeah. even cover something like that? No, I don't know if it's covered or not, but what I'm, my, my, what I'm trying to say is we have the technology today to monitor you so that we can see these things early. Can we stop these? Can we stop the 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 lesions occurring? No. And if you go on intermediate, could lesions occur? Yes. But you have the situation like with David Muslin, where we see it very early and we zap it. But if that's not something that you can tolerate, then and you don't want to take that risk, then it isn't a good idea. But that you've got to weigh that up against quality of life. But as long as you're doing regular scans, you can certainly do PSMA scans every six months. And 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 we we catch it that way. Yeah, I so do, you do regular a... scans. I do do regular scans. But you know, when the PSA came back and it was doubling every eight weeks, it goes from point you know oh four. It it, it grows quickly. And, um, you know, it, and who knows, the lesions might have been there at 0.04 already, but um, it's hard to tell. And, and I guess I can do something that's something to, to uh, address now is PSMA testing, but I, I'm certainly, I'm pretty sure that every three months is not going to be a, a doable uh, yeah. solution, but maybe six months, yes. Go ahead, Jim. Finish your thought. Um, Let's see, how often do you get your uh, test done, anyway, P PSA test? Um, right now, I, I get it done um, every like 12 weeks, three months. I get it every month, and I have been, especially on the holiday, every month I get the test. Oh, yeah, I, I'm still on a drug now, though. Uh, yeah, when I was on the I holiday, don't care. I, had, I, had I don't care. I get the test every month. I have for the last six and three quarter years. I get a battery of tests, I mean, blood test, you know, the whites, et cetera, et cetera, liver, mm -hmm. everything, testosterone. That's, every not, month. that's not common practice, though, Harry. No, it isn't, but no, I know. PSA I test mean, I, every I month. More often when I was on my holiday, but when I'm on the drug therapy, I get it every month. Okay. Thank you, Jim. You're really in an unknown area, Harry, because nobody will be able to um, predict what the risk is. Yeah. And, and the other risk I'm concerned about is too, if they, sometimes they say if you go on a break, it, it's a benefit because the drug may be more effective longer. Uh, rather than staying on continuous, so yeah. I, feel I like think Len would. I think Len earth. might make that argument. Yeah, I think Len would make that argument. Uh, as far as you know, once you've got a couple of years of ADT, and as far as the timing of and the degree of risk, I think that the uh, oncologists are flying by the seat of their pants still, to some degree. Yeah, I wish Len was still here because I know he's kind of have the similar uh, experience. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, a couple well, of times. You, you you can reach out to Len, um, Len at ancan.org, and 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 talk to him about it. Now you know the difference is Len is very laid back, which is different to a lot of people. 
he's not an anxious person. And, and, yeah, and I don't know what his experience is when, when he had holiday. Did he develop lesions or anything before? I don't, I don't know his whole history. So that, he, that's, has, yeah. he has. Yeah. He has. He's gone on holiday and then he's had to deal with lesions subsequently and he's had radiation. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll reach out to him. Thanks. Let me see if I can um, get through the list uh, before we. Rick, are we up against us? time limit we have another half an hour okay russell hoover what do you have to bring up tonight oh a story for you i we've got a guy named rick that keeps telling us we gotta be our own best advocate which reminds me of my grandmother saying to me as a kid trust nobody believe nothing my story goes back to June of 20 through June of 22, where I took Lupron and enzalutamide. And my um, PSA basically went to nothing. And I went all the way through December of 23 with non-detectable PSA. After that, it jumped to one, to four, to nine, to 19 in less than eight weeks. And of course, I got a hold of Dr. E. She put me back on uh, Nubeca and Orgovix and asked me to get a Polarify test done here in Florida, which I did. And here's where the fun starts. I personally mailed that disc to her back in February. Nobody can find it. I made four phone calls from the day I mailed it to her office to see what was going on, what what could I do. They said they had the tracking number, the whole nine yards. Four phone calls, never had a return call to me. They were going to check, never called back. I had a telehealth meeting with Dr. E last Thursday and related all this to her. I said, I'm very disappointed. I said, I have great faith in you, Dr. E, but your staff is driving me to an ulcer. She said she would check it out. And one of the problems was that the last PSA number had jumped to 20.37 from, you know, half a dozen points below that. And we both looked at that and said, that can't be right. So I had the PSA redone last week, and my PSA is actually 3.7, which makes sense because I am on the drugs. In that conversation with Dr. E last week, and by the way, I'm having another converse, telecom health uh, conversation with her again this Thursday to make sure we got all this ironed out, and maybe we can find that disc, or I'll have to redo the test or whatever. I was still asking her, as I do about everybody, about hot flashes. I have never gotten away from hot flashes, even after I was off the medications for a year and a half. There were less, but they were there. And the week before I met with Dr. E, I had my annual physical, with my PCP, and I asked him, because I asked everybody, what do you got for hot flashes? And he said, and... Dr. Hoover here wants credit for this because she found a drug called Vioza, V-E-O-Z-A-H, brand new. So we we asked my PCP about this drug, and he said his, his pharmaceutical rep was in that morning, and he had some. So he gave me a month's supply of this. It works. It just downright works. The, the, the problem is I can't get it. It's only for women. So I mentioned this to Dr. E and she said, well, that's crazy. I said, well, that's the way it is here. And she said she was going to try to get a clinical study going for men with this new drug. Uh, I'm the wrong sex to get it. I could probably get an override from Dr. Lee to get the drug, which may take six to eight weeks, my pharmacist told me. But this stuff right now is about $700 a month for a bottle of pills, which is not in my uh, allowance 
range. And my, my formulary for what I call the pill pushers, they don't even know about it. I talk to them, they don't even have it on their list yet. So whether, whether it's male or female, they don't even know about it yet. So that's my story. I'm sitting, trying to keep my life above water when everybody else except Dr. E seems to be ignoring my ulcer, if you will. That's it. Dr. Jeff, got a comment on that? Yeah, you don't, you don't have to retake your scan. Just call the radiology center where they did the scan and let them send you another disc. Well, they will not send a disc in Florida. You have to pick it up personally. Okay. And the disc is 100 bucks, and it's an hour and a half away, and I'm a little bit pissed on about all that. If I meet with Dr. E again this Thursday and she doesn't have the disc in hand and they can't find it, I'm going to have to do that. Drive an hour and a half, pay 100 bucks, and then what do I do with it? I'm going to mail it again to the same place that lost it? I talked to her number one nurse today, Gabriel, this afternoon. He called to see to tell me that they can't find it. And I said, well, what's going on? I, I put the address on the box myself. I mailed it myself. He said, well, all mail going to the hospital goes to a separate building, and then somebody from that building, you know, physically carries it around to all the offices. And I said, well, what's their story? He goes, I don't know. He said he tried calling Friday. Monday and today, and nobody will answer the phone over there. To which I said, they don't have a voicemail? It's a hospital, a big hospital. He said, no, they don't have a voicemail. I said, what do I do? He goes, he didn't know. I mean, Russ, if he, he, yeah. This is Jerry Pelfrey. I, uh, I just started with Dr. E a while back, thanks to Rick. And, uh, I've had the same problem. Uh, they've lost discs, and then one disc was cracked. So uh, I'm lucky. Uh, I, my radiology group will mail it to them. So I've had them mail them again, and uh, they didn't get that. So I went and got the disc, and I mailed it, and she hasn't nobody's called me so i hope they got it how long ago did you mail it oh uh three weeks ago four a month ago i so, mailed mine back on february 25th which is we're pushing a month now nobody can find it but there's a written there's a signature that they received it so what yeah. why don't you why don't you ask the center that did it for you, if they can yeah. email, if they can email that file. You mean the written file? No, a, a, the scan oh, itself. No, no yeah. they don't do that. Well, I had it done that way. Really? Yes. They said we don't hmm. give you a disc. We have to send it in an encrypted way, and we will send it to your doctor, and and that's. Nothing's going to get lost that way. Uh, Want to bet? <laughs> no. uh, they, you know, when I asked, when I asked them at, at the place I had the test done, how they did things, they said they took the disc and mailed it. And I said, I want to take the disc. I want to mail it with all due respect. Then I know I have some control over when it was mailed, who it was mailed to. We had to correct the dress, yada, yada, yada. So, Russ, I, yeah. I was all I also wonder about the address because after that I have started to do it to the uh, to the outpatient center floor 24 Houston Methodist right and then I write in attention to dr. E uh, that's what I had on there and I also verified that with her nurse last week and I verified it again today did I have the right address, the right zip code? He goes, yep. He said, we have record of it being received. They just don't know where it is. Yeah. Jeez. It's somewhere. Yeah, so this is I, Joe. I, I've had yeah. exactly the same issue uh, with Dr. E's staff. 
Uh, it's getting worse and worse. Uh, you're, you guys are exactly right. Uh, what I have to do now is I take my CDs and I go to a my chart, my radiation oncologist who has can input stuff in my chart, and I put it on my chart. Uh, I let them put it on my chart. The so doctor E can read it on my chart without their. So I bypass the staff basically is what I have to do. Yeah. Hey guys, I want to Russell. I want to get to uh, try to get to at least one more guy before. Okay, I'm done. Okay, so I'm thanks. not the only one. Thank you, guys. No, you're not. Steve Rue, you've been waiting a long time. What have you got for us? Oh, it hasn't been that long, but <laughs> but I've been sitting here listening and picking up a wealth of knowledge. I really love this group and the folks that are in it. We cover a lot, up, don't we? <laughs> I pick up a lot of stuff all the time. So I came home from work today, and lo and behold, I had my FedEx box sitting on my porch with my first box of uh, abiraterone ready to go, some Abby. Um, I was curious, once I start to take that, tomorrow will be my first dose. Uh, if anybody can tell me just a kind of a quick survey of how long – after starting that, would I feel the the first uh, side effects? That's one of the questions I have. Is it like, do I feel something? Do I start feeling those side effects the next day, or does it is it cumulative? Are, does you, it take a month? are you already on Lupron or something like that? Well, that's the other question that I got. I you know I went down and saw Doctor Heath. Or she, the doctor I had here was a medical oncologist, not a GU. Dr. Heath is GU, and she said, yeah, you really should be back on uh, in ADT, and she recommended the Orgovix. We talked about it. The Lupron I had been on previously uh, for just over a year. So and, you're uh, going to start the, back, excuse me, Steve, you're, just to make, cut it quickly, you're going you're gonna to start back on Abby without yet being back on uh, an ADT. She right? prescribed Orgovix. And Abby with prednisone. And you're gonna do you have the organs? No, because after I got the Abby, I got a phone call from mm -hmm. um Dr. Heath's office saying that the insurance company had um uh refused to uh uh you know they de they denied the Orgovix request. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're Dr. basically Heath. going to start cold on Abby right now. Orgovix is going to fill in when they get around they, to it. They want me to start the Abby like right now while they yeah. sort out the Orgovix question. They're going to file, you know, uh, they're going to file a, a whatever you call it, a, a yeah. refile so it to, with insurance. But yeah, to answer gonna... your question, um, how long on – see – we none of us probably have started on Abby without also being on an ADT, and we may not know how long it takes the abiraterone all by itself to hmm. start causing symptoms of low testosterone. Has anyone here ever had the experience of starting on abiraterone yeah. purely by itself? I'm not it, sure we it, can it answer. It could be several weeks before they get this sorted out, but. Yeah. Yeah. My my insurance denied the Orgovix and made a comment that they would approve though uh, for, uh, for Firmagon in its place. Um, the folks I talked to at Doctor He's office were not. They were they were actually amazed that they came back with Firmagon. They said, "Yeah, that's kind of an old school treatment." Well, you if, know, and, if uh, you start on Firmagon, it will start working quite rapidly. Okay. I would say it would start doing its thing within within a few days. If you start so, the Abbey by itself, I don't even really know. Okay, so Firmagon's pretty fast. Um, they made a comment that they might have to fall back on Lupron, though. They said that the Orgovix was what they were pushing for. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Firmagon, I think, will drop your testosterone level quite rapidly. Is that true, Rick, don't you think? So he he must have stepped away, but I, I think it'll be fast. Firmagon will oh. do it in 24 to 36 hours. The Firmagon, yeah. the only experience I've got with Firmagon was that 
within a month after my diagnosis of prostate cancer, I encouraged my brother to get his PSA tested. And lo and behold, he had a PSA that was off the chart. They had him on Firmagon uh, after they removed his prostate. And my brother David did that one shot in the belly for every 30 days. He did that for three months and told him to go to hell, and he didn't do it anymore. He said it was intolerable to the extreme with the Firmagon. Mm -hmm. Uh, if it's intolerable so, for you to take those shots in your belly after a couple months, just switch to Lupron then. Well, they're going to, yeah, we're going to try to avoid that by having the hospital uh, uh, work with the insurance company to get the Orgovix, uh, which is what the, my doctor wants me on Orgovix. The insurance company, who's not a doctor, wants me on something else. That's what it comes yeah. down to. Uh, so they promised me they were going to be fighting like hell for me down there at the uh, Carmenos Cancer Center. But they were very adamant about the fact that they wanted me to go ahead and start Abby as soon as I get it. So I'm, I'm not mm -hmm. I'm not going to argue with them. These guys right. are GU oncologists. They're supposed to be the be some of the best in the country. I bet uh, it'll be fairly yeah. quick. Um, yeah, so, so we'll find out more about that later. But I was curious if anybody had any you know, comparisons with Firmagon versus, uh, uh, you know, with uh, Lupron, because Lupron was what I was on originally. I feel like I'm taking a step back if I go to Firmagon. I'm going back. No, it's, Firmagon's just as perfectly good of a of a ADT drug as Lupron is. Firmagon's a, have, better, Firmagon's a better ADT drug. Than, I actually, yeah, I kind of think the same thing. Firmagon is a second better. generation on, on Lupron. Okay, it works it in a is. different fashion and it works in a better fashion, Steve. So Firmagon works the same way as the Orgovix. Lupron works in a different fashion. If you need another Lupron shot, um, then make sure you ask uh, Dr. Heath if the abiraterone is working as a buffer. I suspect it is. But don't think that Firmagon is worse than Lupron. It's better than Lupron. Okay. okay. And a lot of a lot of health systems won't even approve Firmagon. They make you go with the Lupron. So you're 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 better off, John. I'm 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 just sort of trying to watch the the, the clock here. Um, Jim Marsh, really want... did, you want, did you want to oh, say I'm something sorry. about starting on abiraterone? Or, or yes. Quickly. Well, actually, actually, uh, a point of information, Lupron is no more. It was stopped last year. Eligard is the shot in the belly now. It is exactly the same drug. Abiraterone, I would suggest if you start it, get a liver test every month for the first three months because it might upset the liver. I know I did after month two, and I had to drop from then and with the four pills down to three. Yeah, yes, Dr. Oh. Heath has me scheduled for liver testing every month and my blood pressure daily. So yeah, that's that's true. Another thing I started and with a Lupron, Abby, and it took my PSA to drop down to undetectable about close to five months although it was steadily dropping down and me, uh, after it me, after you get interrupt. there it was that for the next four and a half years let me interrupt and, and tell you where we are with group now um larry never really got to catch us up on the past couple of years since he's been here uh, and that will complete the list of people as of when I took the attendance. Now, after we started the regular group, about a half a dozen more people arrived. I don't know if any of them have urgent issues or not. So yeah. let me start quickly by getting back to Larry and see if you wanted to catch us up uh, this group or wait for if you're going to come back again on a regular basis. Are you still here, Larry? Uh, yes, I am. <clears throat> Thank you for your offer. Okay. Um, I'm good to uh, wait for a week or two and uh, I'll come back and then we'll talk some more. Hopefully I'll not have any uh, microphone problems. 
Okay, yeah, we'll be. It has been a long time, right? Right, about a year. A couple and years. And a half. Mm -hmm. Okay, nothing urgent then. You can come back next Monday and. Absolutely, okay. or, or or the next week on Tuesday. Uh, uh, three o'clock in the afternoon is a better start time for me than uh, six o'clock in the evening. Okay. So the and next then, the next the next meeting that starts at three o'clock in the afternoon will be on the 9th of April, I believe. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Rick. And I also thank you for your information about the uh, um, cholesterol and the torvastatin. I, I hadn't uh, thought about it that way, but yeah, thank you. Now, do Measure. any of you guys that came in uh, late, Mark, Bill, Les, Gary, Dennis, do any of you guys have anything that's pressing and you really want to get it out tonight? Not me. Not me. No, oh, John, I just jumped on to see if uh, I just jumped on to see if uh, someone I'd uh, referred to the group showed up tonight, but he didn't. Oh, okay. And Gary, how about you? Not, not me, John. Thank you. Okay. Henry, I can't remember if you had a chance to tell me if you wanted to speak or not tonight. Are you there, Henry? Okay. Rick, I, I I'm on set. Okay. Okay. Thank um, you. Chaz, you have your hand up. What was on your mind? I just wanted to say something to Steve about my experience uh, getting Orgovix. Steve, if you're still interested in following through on that, because my insurance company turned me down as well. Um, and my my radiologist kept saying, just get in touch with them. They'll give it to you. It happens to my patients all the time. So I called Orgovix directly. They were very helpful. Uh, they steered me to the form to download, fill out, submit to my doctor for him to complete and send in. And I got approved for it. Um, so if you still feel like that might be an option for you, uh, I suggest you get in touch with them to Orgovix directly. I just Direct, Googled directly. Huh? Directly? Orgovix? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you can you call the company. I'll give, I'll give you the phone number if you got a pencil. <laughs> Shoot it to me in chat or something. Yeah, I will. Okay. Thanks, guys. <laughs> hey, my first time at the meeting. Thank you, everyone, for uh, everything tonight, and I'll be back for sure. Our pleasure. Rick, do you have anything no. left over? Jim, no. do you want to get the last word in? Well, I got one for Russell Hoover about the pill, which is for the the uh, females only. And it sounds crazy, but in the political world we are, declare yourself a woman and you can have it. Believe I, I believe you can. <laughs> Honestly, it is insane here in the Washington area, but they do it all the time. Okay. <laughs> so, so that drug that um, that Regina came up with was just recently approved, I think, towards the end of last year, as a drug for women to control um, hot flashes. Right. Um, and it, it it's very good to know that it works um and i think dr e's on to something if she can put a quick trial together and we can get it approved it will be dynamite because we don't really have anything that's good at the same time um i i don't know how you can i don't know how you can get it right now i i, I suspect that if dr e um if you appealed to your, do, do you have do you have a Part D drug policy or do you have um, an Advantage plan? I have a Part D, but I talked to them. They've never it isn't even on their list yet. Okay, but but if you if you can get E to handle it, she'll know how to get around that, even if it isn't on the. It, 
it isn't on their formulary um, because it's so new. And I don't know yeah. how, the, how that happens. And, you know, they make up these formularies at the end of last year. And so probably there, there, are, there are updates. I, I, I don't know. I mean, these, these issues for us start to get a little bit technical. We're not good at solving postage problems and yes, formulary yeah. problems and stuff like that. I don't, I don't know, although I do like, I very much like Joel's suggestion of trying to just load it onto my chart. We've talked about that before. And it does make it easier, but I get the frustration. I get the frustration, but I think Joel's suggestion was a solid one. If you can figure out a way to load it, for them to load it, um, the does the radiation oncologist, um, the, where you had the scan, or the does the radiologist are they on my chart or what are they on? Do they? They are not on my chart. What I'm going to do is I have another telehealth meeting with Dr. E this Thursday. I'm going to ask if she has the disc. If she doesn't, I'm going to put the monkey on her back and say, okay, what do I do? Give me a suggestion. What's the easiest way? You know, I'm, not, I'm to the point I'm not going to get an ulcer over this. No, no, no. I, I think that's right. Just tell her this is where I got it. Please, can you contact contact them and and I have them send you a copy and get her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, Rick. The, Thank the you, everybody, part. for coming tonight. Hey, what's the name of that? Uh, oh, I was just going to close that, Russell. I'll put the drug in the chat, somebody. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Well, can Russell, that? what's the name of the drug? I don't. I was it Vioza? Vioza? Yeah. B E O Z A H. I spelt it right. Vioza. Yeah, and from what my PCP tells me, the other drugs around that try to to knock down hot flashes are trying to knock down the chemicals that are already being produced from the brain. This particular drug goes to the brain and shuts down all the impulses. So the, the signal to make the hot flash can't start. Whatever, it worked. Okay. Hey, everybody. Thank you for coming. We'll see you next Monday. Good luck, Jim. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Doctor. Hope to see you Monday. Thanks, we'll everybody. Bye, everybody. Great meeting, guys. Thanks again. Nice, Thanks. nice spicy Thanks, meetings. Tom. And Thanks, nice spicy meetings. John, hold on a sec. We'll, everybody, we'll, uh, Bill, you can you can hang in too. Just we'll, we'll let's kick the other two out. We got five minutes. Uh, let me excuse Jerry Pelfrey, and we'll excuse. The general. Okay. John, you know, in a sense, the leads has to take some responsibility here. This thing with Jack, with Dr. Jack, was very uncomfortable and it's useless. There's, there's just no point in somebody coming back to us after we've told them a million and one times and then they want to come back and then they want it explained now i mean rick, it, it rick you want to stop the recording oh thank you we edit that out right <laughs> thank you